When he appeared one Saturday morning at one of Sir Robert Mayer's children's concerts in his 75th year, he walked slowly and heavily to the rostrum. When he arrived there, he bowed to the little boys and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, I should not like you to think that my almost imperceptible progress to the podium this morning was due to any reluctance on my part to perform to an audience of children. No, my slow progress was due entirely, I'm afraid, to the infirmities of old age. Now, the first piece on our program this morning is by Mozart. He wrote it at the age of, well, when he was about your age, sir. I came to love him. His poses and his high disdain, his courteousness, and his rudeness, his intolerance, and his generosity. At my last meeting with him... Oh, a white lady for my friend. He drinks nothing else. <laughs> he calmly planned his next decade or so. I shall conduct only 18th century French music of a very select order. He would buy a house in France. The only civilized place left on the face of the earth. He would conduct few operas. No singers for me today, my dear fellow. They all want microphones. Life, he was beginning to realize, begins at 70. In fact, the first 70 years are the worst. <laughs> and his philosophy of life? Try everything once. Except incest and folk dancing. <laughs> Cosmopolitan and Lancastrian, a man in whom wit was enriched by humour, in whom knowledge was changed to culture by sensibility, a complex man of uninhibited mind and temperament, bland, enigmatic, impulsive, selective and uh, quite often capricious. At his 70th birthday, Telegrams and cables from distinguished persons arrived from all over the world. Congratulations, greetings, Strauss, Stravinsky, Hindemith, Sibelius, <laughs> nothing from Mozart. <laughs> At 80, he conducted Goosen's newly scored Messiah, 
At a rehearsal, he had noticed the simpering manner in which a chorus of elderly spinsters had been singing, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, come along, ladies. A little more joy, please. And not quite so much astonishment. <laughs> In 1957, Thomas Beecham was asked to make a speech at the University of Congress in Washington. He chose to address his public upon a subject very dear to his heart, the changing world of music. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of this address is really little more than the memories, the recollections, and the experiences of about 65 years of music on my part. Of the world of music that I knew as a boy, practically nothing today remains as it was. It may interest you to know that no one in any country has written a good tune for over 30 years. Now, think of it, you who profess to love music. If you profess to practice it or to cherish it, how do you do so? You remember the melodies of the great composers. You remember the melodies of Bach and Handel and the operas of Mozart with scores of splendid tunes and the great songs of Schubert and Schumann and the tunes of Haydn and Brahms and Borschak and others. They haunt your minds and memories. You think of them as you get up in the morning and you recall them to yourselves again as you go to bed at night. That is cherishing music. Now then, how much serious music written over the last 25 years can you cherish and go to bed with? I have on many occasions in mixed communities invited any of those present to get up upon a chair or a table and sing to me any aria that has been composed over the last 30 years. And no one has been able to respond to the invitation because they could not remember the tune memory. No, you've got to see the music. Then you can scarcely believe it. <laughs> it's like the farmer. The farmer who went to the zoo, saw the giraffe the first time, gazed at it for 25 minutes, and then as he turned away slowly, he was heard to remark, I don't believe it. <laughs> I knew every one of the melodies of Mozart from beginning to end by the time I was 10 or 11 years old. I never wavered in my devotion to the mistunes. Never. were a dictator, I would make it compulsory for everyone between the ages of eight and eighty to listen to Mozart for a quarter of an hour every day for five years. Now then, I call this little talk the changing world of music. Changing world. It was something like heaven 60 years ago. And I won't go so far as to suggest that it has reached the precise antipodes. <laughs> but it is going there, <laughs> rapidly. 